or questioning your solidarity because solidarity runs the risk of flattening and oversimplifying. And, and the very problem that I just articulated that when a group of people come together for a certain kind of common cause or motivation, they all run the risk of you know, becoming part of the group and therefore subsuming their individuation and their individual sort of ideas. And we all sort of complain, right, if we're part of any member of any type of group, like, you know, that you're just lumping us all together. And it, it happens no matter if you're talking about, you know, you know, uh, African Americans or if you're just talking about people who are soccer moms, you know. So it's this idea of flattening and oversimplification. And I think that was, you know, the issue. But I think that, that you were trying to critique. But I also think that, you know, we have to sort of acknowledge the, the necessity of solidarity. Um, at, you know, in, in, in a certain time and place. I mean, I think we can acknowledge its shortcomings, but I think the idea of a group of people coming together, you know, at a certain historical moment to express an ideological position, which is counter to the dominant and systemic structure of the world that they live in. And the people who came together to do that were of all sizes, shapes, and stripes. And I think that that, that is, is maybe solidarity in, in the best light. Um, and how that, I mean, that's, okay, that's the political argument for solidarity. And I think we can also see that there, there are sometimes in times in history there's a need for those kinds of coalitions to build, to kind of create and create social change. And so the question is, how does that get expressed in art? And that's kind of where I'm more confused about what you wrote about, because I'm not so sure. The work in the exhibition was actually pretty diverse. You know, ranging from like fairly abstracted sculptures to very representational drawings to assemblages. So in terms of solidarity being expressed in that way, in an artistic way, um, do you do you think that sorry to interrupt? Yeah, but, no, uh, yeah. I forget what I was gonna say. But do you think uh, Hammond's aside, are there artists in that show that deserve a much higher profile within today's art world than they have had. Well, I mean, and, is, and will this so actually make that correction happen? Um, it has the potential to make that correction. And I, and I think, as, as Will pointed out, the show is about a cross-pollination in the community. The idea of art, the introduction of art as a community activity, not just an individual activity. And maybe that's where the solidarity that you're questioning comes in. But the fact that artists no, no, I mean, yeah. to me, it, the solidarity had to do with what struck me, that all, almost all the work in the show represented, uh, in one way or another, a black person's experience of being black in American culture. Yeah, well, yeah. no, but, okay, it did not. <laughs> it represented a group of people at a given time. No, not the show, place. but individual work. Say it again. In, the works by different people in the show, most of them were about their identity as black people. But when is work never about your identity? I mean, it's. I mean, you only work on your identity, and uh, uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's more politic that identity. Well, there's work that's, 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 that's there's people. work that's only about identity. There's work that comes out of identity to. Uh, address. But, but this is why I want to get back to the complexity that this is a, a kind of historical show framed by a curator or an institution, okay? So she picked certain work to describe a culture of a time, you know, in L.A., addressing a subject matter of a certain community, No, no, right? but, but so, I've, I've already acknowledged okay. my deficiency in that, okay. in that area because my point was that what I wrote was more like an essay that this show prompted in me. Right. And, and I would have preferred it to have been presented to readers that way. So uh, that, that may have been confusing. But to go back to, but the issue that came up for me is, and I think, what, what the, the, the drift of this seems to be that I'm putting the blame on, or, or I'm finding fault with artists for not, for, for being something. That so therefore uh, they haven't succeeded. Uh, that's why they're not considered now 
famous artists. But you seem to have point, this obsession with now famous artists. Like the female gaze was the same thing. It's like the comments there. Well, I'll, I'll, I mean, to your point, which I think what I'm talking about is like the. the Sorry. Right. I mean, to your, to your point, in, in, in the article, there's a, there seems to be some uh, sincere questioning of um, the, the, the white high art world, as you put it, and this idea of inclusion um, and why that is. I think what the way that it was framed was was uh, you know sort of debatable. Um, it definitely was it definitely was provocative in, in, in relationship to the rest of the article. Um, so, so I think, what am I trying to say? Well, I'm, 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 I'm look, you use the term correctly. <coughs> well, let's, and, go, and, let's, let's go back to, to what we were talking about as a little off. Well, I wanted to talk about notions of value and how you invoke the white kind of art world, and you seem to be seem to be offering possibly a criticism, you, you mentioned the covert solidarity of the liberal white folks, um, and, but it comes across in a very different way because you're both invoking the white and high end art world and you're also completely concurring with it. Yeah, the same point, time, I think. Can we concur with you? Well, in terms of celebrating, I mean, and I do think they're the a great artist, but in terms of, of all of the artists in the exhibition, he's the one that you single out, and at the same time, you invoke the white and high and art world and confer, in a sense. Can I jump in for just a quick second? Yeah. I just want to say, to say, say this, just add this. Um, you know, when, when I first read the piece, I was my feeling were when I first read the two pieces. And I read it. Um, you know, I, I'm very skeptical of Times reviews in general um, for a, a range of reasons. Uh, you know, I read a review of Rasheed Johnson last year that was, um, it was short, and uh, but it missed so much in its criticism. You could tell that the writer didn't have a background and didn't care to do the work to find out what they might be missing, you know. Now mind you, you can have a problem with an exhibition, or uh, an artist's work, but it does help uh, the public, um, uh, artists themselves, other critics, people interested, if there is some kind of background for crowding that's happening. Um, now, I want to just jump in and say this in your, in your defense. I don't think, um, upon reflection, and shortly thereafter, I don't think he meant any harm in what he wrote. I do think, um, there's, there's, uh, there was a lack of craft, if I, if I may say so, um, in, in the piece. And immediately what I thought about was, as a writer, as a person who has to deal with an editor and have a great relationship with uh, the person that I've been for the last year, you're often asked to do things on the fly really quickly and just get the copy in and trust the editor to do uh, some of that work for you, to ask you some of those questions. What did you mean by this? Have you properly researched this? Do you understand the context of, of, of the artwork that you're writing about? Um, and, I, and I don't fully fault you for that. I also would love to bring to task your editor and the editorial staff at the Times, um, because a lot of those reviews come off as a bit sloppy. Now, that's fine when you have, uh, when you're so, socioeconomically powerful, and you're being represented um, by the status quo. If you're a white male artist or a very, very wealthy blue chip artist, and someone writes haphazardly about your work, it doesn't really matter so much. You've already been, you're established, you know, you have, <clears throat> you have enough backing. With artists that are not in that category, non-white uh, non artists, and women in particular, and many of which <clears throat> who have been uh, in terms of historical shows have been not necessarily written out of history, but fairly much omitted, uh, whether purposefully or not. There wants to be even more care because you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with the livelihood and the, uh, the psychological health and the emotional health of individuals who are, for the most part, like all artists, practicing art to their detriment. Uh, to their personal detriment, 
and they can't help it. And they're, um, and more than empathy, we're talking about compassion. And that, that compassion to go the extra step to do the research to talk about work properly. And you know, that's what was at stake for me when I read, the, when, when I read those pieces. Again, I want to iterate, I don't think that you were being consciously mean. But, but I do, but, I, but with that said, when you say things like, thanks to white artists like George Herms, Bruce Conner, and Ed Kleinholz, assemblage was popular on the West Coast in the 1960s. Appropriated, appropriated by the artists and now dig this, however, it takes on a different complexion. It took on a different complexion. So I wonder when you say something like that, if you realize, Ken, that you're, I don't know if you're being snide or um, if you realize that could be offensive racially, that line, um, or where the editor was in checking that. Do, do, can you? You know, this is really starting to feel like a public flogging. It's not. You know, no, no, really. There's like four people now who've yeah. spoken against him, and the points that are being made are not indisputable. You know, the point about this being a history show, for example. I'm just, I don't want to interrupt too much, but how about some other voices? Your point is disputable. Can I try to frame this a, a, a little differently? Because I'd be curious. Um, a few, some time ago, I, I came across this idea of, in sociology and linguistics of the marked and the unmarked category. And <coughs> the, the unmarked category is someone's walking down the street. I, I saw someone walking down the street. It's the default thing that comes to mind. So, and then I, you know, I imagine a white man walking down the street. I, no. Well, because you are a white man? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the unmarked category in art, say, today, is like what you have at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, it's art. Art is just art. It struck me that when you have art that's solidarity, it's a kind of self-marked category. Like, I'm, I'm of a certain uh, category in the larger society. That I make art about that, and perhaps in in opposition to the the sociology that has marked me. And what I'm saying is like the the, the in the sort of white hierarchy of things, there's art, and then there are various marked art categories. Um, Native American art, so. And that was one of the things I would, and also you, you say that this was a show about history and, and uh, you know, 900 words, I couldn't fully do justice to the history of it, but that wasn't what I, it's also a show that was organized within the past two or three years, so it's, it's an event that is very much about our contemporary moment in uh, in the art world, and the notion saying this is a show that acts as a corrective is it's a marked show. It's saying this is a show about something that's been overlooked. Uh, we insist that you pay attention to us. I'm just saying that art that's made out of that spirit has a certain limitation. It can be uh, in inspiring and empowering for people who are doing that, but people on the outside can say, oh, well, not only is it maybe not really about my life, it's actually maybe accusing me of something that I'm not sure if I'm, uh, that I may or may not be guilty of, I don't know. Wait, can I ask a question? Couldn't that be as much the uh, curatorial fault as an artistic fault? Like what happens if you shift the blame to the curator for producing a sensation like that instead of the artist? Can you say that one more time with the mic, please, yeah. for the people downstairs? <laughs> <laughs> He's saying that um, this, he thinks that this is a, as much a question for the curator as it would be for the audience. Yeah. Well, oh, sorry. I guess 
what I was saying was it, it feels strange to me to blame the artist when maybe there's something uh, valid about your critique. And that thing most certainly would have been generated by the curator. And, and, and how could you hold the artist responsible? It seems no, absurd. I don't think anybody is blaming the artist here. And I think that's one of the larger misconceptions that have circled around this debate is that either Ken or anybody else was, was blaming the artist for I, well, all their success. It sounded like you were holding uh, <laughs> the artist accountable for, for a certain type of functioning that, that seems like you could also hold the curator accountable for. On some Thanks. level, everybody no, my, accountable for what they do. Look, these movements came out of the 60s, and it wasn't like, it was all kind of, it was gay, it was feminist, uh, and it seemed like a really exciting thing to do to get people like like-minded people together, put on shows, uh, make the stadial establishment pay attention, loosen up, let them in. Great. Now this identity politics is totally pervasive in academia. It is the orthodoxy. And well, I, 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 I mean, first off, I don't think it's a public flogging. I think we're in a debate yeah. and we're having a discussion. Excuse me, wait. In a, in a good way. Debate. Okay, you have so. One, two, so, three, four, five people, six people up here, and Ken. That's not right. It's so bad. Okay. It, it's, yeah. You're not. I was expecting I like there would be an equal number of people so agreeing so with Ken as against Ken. And that is not what has happened here. No one's sir, against sir, Ken. Hold, hold on just a second. Well, who, who, wait. Really? Like, you talked about it. Ken. Who is thinking who's going to be on the other side? Because well, everything sir, I read was sir, equally sir, right. sir, uh, just it's, it's in the oh, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Well, well, first off, wait, wait, I, I don't say that. Hey, I this have is the best part. Ken for many years. And Ken and I have been friends, can I say that? Oh, for many years. And Ken trusts, I'm only speaking for myself, I did not organize this event. But I certainly think what I said at the beginning, I would hope to be true. That we can, Ken is perfectly capable of give, we're giving, I think, him a forum to answer questions that have been out there. And Ken is perfectly capable of answering them, or not. But I don't think any of us have the intent here of getting, we're trying to air issues that have been discussed via Facebook, via real people in the room. So, and I think we but completely from one I think angle, really you're not, there's no, there's no debate here. Uh, uh, just, let's just, just make this quick announcement. What we plan on doing is having this conversation to up to a point, and then there's a microphone. And so, and we expected Ken to invite people who would, who would side with him, if that's what we're talking about, sides, or make agreements with him, or, or not, or ask questions. So if there's someone who has a problem with something that someone else other than Ken has said, um, please grab the mic politely, express your point, and we'll listen. It's an open conversation. And our lives, all of us, are affected by that, no matter what side of slavery, Holocaust, whatever other issues that we can all determine went on during the 19th century, and in many cases, continue to go on. And I think that we can serve each other by being able to express how we feel about these things. And I find it very commendable for Ken that he's able to say, I feel like I'm being made to feel guilty. And maybe we do feel guilty. Why do we feel guilty? It's not maybe because we've done anything, but we need as artists and as people to start to unpack these issues and try to understand how we can find a way to go forward from this point. And we can see by the emotions that are in this room that this is a hot button issue for all of us. And nobody has the answer. And like I said earlier, I think if we can figure out what kind of question we need to ask now, we'll be doing each other a great service. Um, well, I, you know, and I also wanted to maybe move the conversation away from the specific review that Ken 
You also answered a question that Ken asked me earlier, which was there was there any artist in the show for which you had a reevaluation or you know would make you you know think about things differently? And, and and the way that I can answer that is that many of the artists in the show were artists that I was unfamiliar with before going into the show. I asked you that question. Well, you said well you said is there another artist in the show for whom this curatorial strategy might. I'm paraphrasing. But oh, exactly. no, I think I meant would leverage into right. the, so, his, the art history books. Yeah. It would, give, it would serve the sure. corrective. But I have to answer that question by first saying that I was unfamiliar with the majority of the artists in the show before going in, which is maybe a different experience than a lot of other exhibitions where I already have quite a bit of historical knowledge about it because I've been schooled in it. And I just haven't, I haven't been schooled. You know, this, this work hasn't been, a lot of the work hasn't been sort of first of all, written very much about, and then therefore when things aren't written very much about, they don't come into sort of the canon of education, and a lot, you know, our knowledge is dependent on what our exposure is, and so just to answer that question, when I saw the show, Charles White is an artist on the show who uh, does these representational um, pencil drawings, and it struck me, thinking about it, I've been familiar with Charles Gaines's work for a long time, and then thinking about maybe the relationship that Charles Gaines had to Charles White and the influence that possibly Charles White had on Charles Gaines and then that influence then being carried on to other artists such as Sam Durant or Andrea Bowers and I think it, it to contemporary artists and I think it goes to this question of where is value, how do we assign value? And you from Charles White to Sam Durant. I, I find that hard to follow. Well, I mean, I think that they, those artists that I've mentioned have used drawing, used pencil drawing to sort of depict um, figures um, and to talk about political issues. So, well, but, I, I, but I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm brainstorming here. I'm trying to think about, you know, I'm coming into the, you know, obviously to bring a contemporary lens, and I think that's the point you're making is but, that. Sorry. Right. Can, can I go back to something um, Chris, sorry, Chris was saying uh, that uh, a show like this obliges me to, to be more compassionate and careful than I might otherwise be if it was a Jeff Koon show. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I'm not an art historian and reviews in the New York Times aren't, it's not art history, it's a review and it's written in like, you know, two days. Uh, I do the best I can. The editors do the best they can. But here's the, what what I'm struck by in what you said is that there's a kind of moral leverage that the show is exerting on me because of the population it represents. I feel like the respect I owe to any artist is my honesty. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. And I may overstep in, in different directions, but that to me is love. And like bending over backwards to say, oh, these, these are not, you know, like it's not a petting zoo. It's like, well, <laughs> no, it's, it's, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I definitely agree with you. I think that there, you know, I agree with you and I disagree with you. I'm trying to be as concise about this as I can. One, I, I don't know, reviews in the New York Times aren't art history. But they are microfiched now, saved as digital files for the rep, for, for as long as there's a time, as long as there's a Yeah, the world. first step on the way to art history. What's that? The, the first step on the way to art history. Yeah, exactly. So these reviews and these, these comments that are written set the tone and the pace of how an artist is going to be received throughout their career and posthumously. And those things have a fact. You know, it's, it's um, with, I think, and this is to take the conversation away from from your review, and, and not necessarily, this is not about, this is us talking now. Um, um, and I really appreciate you coming in. So it's very cool that you do this. Um, when, when we, what, we, what we don't consider when we deal with, when we're talking about art and how it's being treated critically is that we, one of the things that we don't dis discuss often enough is that there's money involved. There is uh, social standing that's involved. Um, when an artist dies who's, who's wealthy and has done well because they've been treated well by, by the apparatus of the art world or whatever art world has been written about well and has collected, his children, his grandchildren, their children. 
get the proceeds. They, they live off of it. It, it, it balances, you know, it, it gives money to these, these people. If you look at how much money and how much financial and socioeconomic support African Americans have, uh, Hispanic people have, non whites have, uh, if compared to that of whites, it's devastating the difference, right? And so here's this area, the art, where people get to express uh, their, their lives and, and get to tell their stories however they want to tell them. I mean, you know, Bob Ryan, he, you know, the paintings don't really say that much to a lot of black people I know, but to people who are interested in painting, it does. But, you know, do we have to have a certain amount of empathy to go there, you know, with him, you know, um, kind of losing myself here. You're talking about Robert Ryan? Yeah. Um, I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that what, this is the, uh, what I was going to say, is that even someone like Ryan, in spite of their seeming to be a missing narrative, or a missing identity. The work has, is, is telling us something. And it's telling a particular story to a partic that's about a particular individual. And, you know, we can, we can follow a narrative that abstract, or we can follow somebody like, you know, like uh, uh, William Bell, you know, who's the antithesis of that. Our, what we're asking, I think, and this is not a question just to you, but a question to the room, is how do we assess what kind of life is more valuable than another kind of life? You know, if these artworks represent lives, you know, I mean. Can I add something to that? A little bit to that? The, sure. The, 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 the fact that I, I, I kind of go on with you, but I think there's something else here, which is a kind of uh, maybe this is something that, that we could talk about is this kind of notion of a kind of post identity kind of world. Like living, that we kind of live in a post identity world, and so it's no longer, uh, a lot of these things are no longer important, real social um, inequities um, somehow uh, don't seem to, seem to have a kind of a really kind of drifted away, and so we don't have to be kind of sensitive to those things, or, or we're, you know, um, maybe, I don't know, can you can speak to this, but. Does shock or surprise when you bump into those when you when you bump into that kind of uh, um, tension that's the real social that the real social tension. So in the way that I see that happening is the kind of the kind of effort of trying to of, of, of a curator, right? Uh, you can't call an artist, I agree with this, this guy. Uh, a curator trying to tell a particular story. And I think you should be critical of that. I don't think that you should say, go um, you know, I, I'm going to be completely sympathetic to the show because, because because of these sort of social inequities. But there you have a problem because on one on one hand you're, you know you bump, in, you, you bump into them, so you don't have to be necessarily uh, so sensitive that you you know have a kind of critical edge. But how do you how do you have that critical edge and be aware of, of these of that that there are other complex things out. Well, let me ask, let me pose this as a question because I don't really know the answer because I, I don't, I've been out of touch with teaching and students. Is there a pressure, is there a felt pressure if, I'm, this is a total cartoon, all right. Uh, here's the incoming class of MFA students. Here's how, the, here's how the black people, you're black, that's special, you have a special identity. You can make work about that. You white people, that's not special. You can make work about anything you want. Is there, now, sorry, I'm just, that's offensive. But I, I'm, 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 I just mean, is there a felt pressure if you're like visibly or internally? I, I think we should talk about that. No, I think that's part of the key here. And I don't think that's necessarily true. 